Hey, Oscar fans, Evan Blaine here with Sam McEwen. It is a virtual edition of the Pick 6 podcast. We're both in our Lincoln homes, yes, Sam? Yes. Uh, hanging out today. It's, it's Busy state tournament week, lots of stuff going on. So, yeah, hello to everyone. We're both home. It, it, it uh, is sort of into the spring season, but it feels like winter still. We got some snow. I think more snow is still on the way. It's officially college baseball season because games are getting canceled and postponed and moved around. Uh, state tournament roads are snowy, all that good stuff. Um, but a lot to talk about this week. Um, we had our second chance to speak with players and coaches for Nebraska football. Uh, the university has agreed in principle to a new multimedia rights deal. Nebraska men's basketball may never lose another game again. So all kinds of stuff going on. We're going to hit on all that. Uh, I thought we'd lead off though, Sam, with the, the survey news that came out today that Nebraska conducted, uh, spearheaded by Trev Alberts. They put it out. What was it? 22,000 responses. Uh, Just under like 22. That. Yeah. Where they where they broke down all sorts of different things from thoughts on gambling to thoughts on alcohol, what they what they feel like they do well in the stadium, what they feel like they can improve upon. It was a really wide ranging survey. I thought there were a lot of interesting things. What stood out to you in kind of the feedback from fans? I'll give you five things, and I'll Go. make them quick. First, I wasn't surprised, but I think that the response to the positivity. Um, on alcohol is notable. I think the, um, the positive was 58, the negative was 28, and the neutral was 14, uh, which basically means you have a, you know, all, a super majority of people who either wouldn't mind or actively want to be able to drink alcohol in the football stadium. That's the first one. Um, I wasn't surprised by the seat comfort issue. But the, but the startling nature of that, I think, jumped out. The fact that on a scale of one to seven, and these are Nebraskans we're talking about, generally are going to be pretty nice, even if they don't love something. But they really don't love those seats. And when, when that is the number one issue um, for why fans aren't coming, you know, it's cost of game, which you would think, and then seat comfort. And that was the 42% of the respondents said, this is why we don't come to more games. Um, and CSL, the company that did the surveys, um, they do it for other power five schools. And Nebraska's answer on that was way above other schools. It gives you an idea of, of the genuine concern that there is at this moment about, you know, the quality of the seats. I thought that was notable. Um, I thought the fact that, and I didn't really put a lot in this. I'm going to put this in a later story. They basically test drove six different premium seating options, six or seven. Mm -hmm. And the one that came out the winner was the ledge seats. These are end zone seats. Basically, it's kind of like a bar stool chair and you've got kind of a tabletop and it's sort of a loungy thing. And then they give you sort of access to a private, you know, little area where you probably can get an, you know, another beer or go to the bathroom. But that was really popular. Um, the number, the respondents on that were higher than anything else. And that, that was notable to me. You, so, you know, you, you saw people, I think, who might partially because you can probably pay for it. There, it's not overly expensive. I think that was, that was a thing. Uh, the, lack of, the lack of enthusiasm for the red balloon release, I thought was surprising. Um, I think we as journalists always see that as a big deal because, you know, we, it's a tradition. I don't know that the fans love that as much. That scored a 5.4 on a scale of one to seven. And again, most of the things, anything that scores around a five should be considered much lower than that because people are just usually really nice. Um, and then, you know, just the differences in the age demographics. Um, and you can talk about gaming if you want, but the, but the, the gap uh, in terms of like alcohol and legalized gaming um, in the stadium, I thought was, I thought was really notable. Um, just, you know, people who are, uh, 55 or above, um, don't really care for either one of those, but they care. They, they d dislike much more the gambling. Um, whereas people below that age are, are pretty excited about it. And, uh, that, yeah, that's, that was notable, at least to me, it was 45 and above. Um, I, I, uh, I actually was a little surprised that the, 
the support numbers for gambling were as high as they are. I just don't think that many people gamble in, in the world. And so I was a little surprised by the height of that, those numbers, but yeah, that were my main takeaways. What about you? I thought the, the age demographic stuff was interesting. Uh, well, first of all, how they broke down the respondents. So the majority of people that responded were 45 years or older and made hundred thousand dollars a year or more. So that kind of gave you a sense of, you know, where, where most of those voices were coming from. But yeah, I mean, to your point about the, the delineation of age and how that affected opinions on a lot of different issues was interesting to me because that's sort of the battle that they're fighting, right. Is to pass that, that uh, next generation of fan um, that passion to get, to get them to come to the games instead of uh, staying at home and, and watching it on their phone or watching it from the comfort of their own living room or whatever. So they had more than 90% of fans, if you broke it down, more than 90% of fans, 54 and younger, would attend at least the same amount of games or more if there were alcohol. So, I mean, that's overwhelmingly positive in terms of getting fannies in the seats. And then gambling, I mean, it was more split overall, but at least 70% of people 54 and younger said it would either increase their, their attendance or make no difference to it. So I think a lot of it, it, it sort of raises an interesting question of like, what's your goal if you're Nebraska and, and Trev Alberts, is it more immediate uh, type stuff like seat comfort and widening the seats and, and more legroom or things like that? Or do they take more of a longer term approach with this thing and say, okay, this is how we really keep those, those fans in their twenties into their thirties and their forties and make them donors is by bringing in what would in Nebraska be pretty radical changes in terms of gambling and alcohol and maybe those, those ledge seats and some of the other options that they have. So sort of the, the age thing is, is fascinating to me because those are the folks who are not currently in power. Those aren't the people that are, that are commanding the greatest uh, earning potential right now, right. but uh, over the long term, again, you want a healthy program. You want those folks to be happy too. Yeah. I agree with that. You know, a hundred thousand dollars, people hear that number and they think whatever they think, but you know, that's not an uncommon income for a, for a two person working family any longer. So it's, it's middle-class ish. Um, and I think what you're battling there is that most of the people who are in that income bracket first probably have at least a 60 inch TV, maybe a hundred inch TV. Uh, second, probably have a, have a, have a phone, a good phone, and they follow along, they look at scores, they look at Twitter, you know, they, they do all of those things. They have, they have all the devices at home. And so kind of what you're, what you're kind of competing for is you've got to try to create simultaneously an experience that makes it seamless to go from the world that you're kind of used to at home to the stadium. There's got to be an ease of going to the bathroom, getting food. Those two things I think are really important. And there's got to be a relative ease as it relates to parking and getting into the stadium. Simultaneously, you want to give them an added experience that they can't get at home. And how do you do that? You know, like how do you get somebody to pay, you know, more money to go there? You, that's where they've got to try to figure those things out. And you, you do probably have to improve the seat comfort I think there is a benefit to being at the game in terms of atmospherics and like community and group and all that other stuff. But you've got to make sure that people have the individual amenities that they really want, which is they want a beer. And most of this is beer. There's a few wine coolers, hard lemonades, but it's mostly beer. You want a beer. Uh, you want a place to put your beer, not in, the, not in the ground. When you're at home, you don't put it on the carpet. You know, you put it on a table or you put it in a cup holder. Um, and you, you know, you want to have, you want to be able to go to the bathroom in like four minutes instead of 17 and you want to be able to get some food and, you know, so you've got to integrate that. And then also what, what's the cool part of the experience. And I think Nebraska knows that they've got 200 to $250 million of renovations. Let me repeat that again, 200 to $250 million in renovations. It's going to be a huge undertaking. Um, now, to build a whole brand new stadium would cost a billion. So it's not a brand new stadium. But, you know, it's a huge undertaking that they're about to undertake. 
And I think there's also a sense of in order to prime the pump for the next generation of fans, you're going to have to give them more than what they're getting now. Uh, And you're going to have to pay back all the things that they've given to the football program. And I think it's accurate to say that Nebraska football season ticket money has gone to pay for everything else on campus. All the other amenities, with the exception of PBA and Haymarket Park, which were paid for essentially by city taxpayers. um, The other the other things were built by Nebraska football fans. Um, it's just sort of spillover money. And so I think there's a feeling within that department, it's time to pay back the fans for all the money they've given us by giving them a better experience. And so I, I think this is a launching point. I think they've got pretty clear data uh, to go forward. When you see phrases like, you know, positive or neutral, and it's 72%, and they're including the neutral, you can kind of sense where they're going. And, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's notable to me. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I, I think I've probably said this on here before, but going to Oklahoma last year, I thought was a good example of like what it could be because it, it was a smaller capacity. They had, I don't know if you'd call them those ledge seats, but they had sort of that, uh, I don't know what you'd call them, like areas with, with tables that you could sit in. They were kind of like suites, but they were open air. Uh, combination of ledge seats, ledge seats and club seats. So yeah. Oklahoma blends those two things. Whereas I think, and Nebraska might do the same thing. That's what they basically were. Yes. So, so those things were, were neat and they, they had the foresight to have those sort of open congregating areas where students could gather uh, just sort of a, of an, of an area where people could stand around and have a drink yeah. and, and converse and things like that. And so I agree. Like in, in the larger sense, what you're looking for, one, is a way for people to, to come together in community. And I think you see that across sporting events now all the time where sometimes people go to the game. They don't even really want to stay in their seats. They just want to walk around the concourse, walk around a circle. And if you can see the game while you're doing that, all the better. I think the other thing that a lot of people want and you talk about what you can get at the stadium that you can't at home is the status of it. Hey, I have club seats. Hey, I have a ledge seat. Hey, I, you know, I'm, I have, I have a chair back. I have, you know, whatever it might be like that, that is important to a lot of people. And I think that was reflected in the survey results too. I was struck by how many, um, how many people said that the team's performance is keeping them away from games. I, I shouldn't be surprised, but I think that indicates what it actually, I think it indicates is there are a lot of people who go to the games, um, just like even if the team isn't great, but the team has gotten bad enough to the point where like that does affect their their bottom line. I think at a lot of schools, when you at a lot of schools, the fans who attend the games are the fans who really want to be there anyway, whether the team's winning or losing. I think at Nebraska, people go in all kinds of weather, as they say. Um, but I actually think it's gotten to the point where people are like, I can't go because it hurts too much to go and watch nothing but losses. Mm-hmm. I don't think they're staying away out of a boycott. I think they're staying away because it, it, you don't want to waste your whole day on a loss. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And like, you know, I, I'm an alum, you're an alum, like 20 years ago, you went to the game because that's just what you did. And now there's, there's so many other options out there. Uh, I mean, you're, you, it's just so tough because you're competing with so many different things additional to what you were 20 years ago. You can watch any game on TV. You have your phone. Um, there's just so many other options out there. So it's, it's interesting. Um, again, to me, like the long-term and short-term tension is, is fascinating to me. Like how much of what they want to do is sort of a bandaid on a lot of these symptoms and how much do you go full on and, and renovate this thing? Because You know, if you walk around inside Memorial Stadium, as we know, uh, what they've done for the last handful of renovations is just build outside of what already existed. So there's an older Memorial Stadium inside West Stadium, and then there's the new stuff on the outside. How much do you continue to sort of build on top of that? And how much do you invest in in a total sort of restructure of the bones of the gray old lady? That's a great point. That's a heck of a point, Evan. It's, 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 a hard, it's a hard question to answer. I do think you just basically tear down South Stadium and start over. 
like there's the one place where you don't have to worry about it being affecting the uh, uh, what do you want to call it? The, the, uh, the practice facility, the new um, the new football training center that they're going to have, you know, the new football building. Um, you, you can, you can do whatever you want with South stadium and have a lot of fun there and do some different things. Um, I don't know how much you can do to East stadium. I really don't. There's some room over there. West stadium. You really can't do anything. I mean, there's not, you can, you can, you can widen the seats, but there's just very little to do over there. There's no room to, you know, tear it all down and close off that street and all that. So I think South and East is where they're going to have to do a lot of the work and, and certainly South, you know, they've got to create a new end zone experience over there. Um, we've been to a bunch of stadiums, you and me, you know, I, I, I liked Oklahoma. I thought, I, I think Iowa's new end zone is a little big so that, you know how they got that end zone project a little big. I thought it was a little, little sizable over there. And they, they decided to go with kind of like a big, kind of a big addition. Texas A&M's is a little big. Um, I've seen Utah's on TV. I like that. I like it to be a little bit smaller and a little bit more exclusive, a little bit more open-ended. Um, you know, Ohio State really doesn't have anything premium on that one open end zone. That's their student section. Michigan didn't have much, you know. Like some of these stadiums are going to get caught behind the game because they, they're so old and they're so big, and they've squeezed them into these such small spots, and they've expanded them so much that it's actually hard for them to kind of reimagine it. Penn State, the flip side is true. Penn State exists on a hill, a very cold, mucky, rainy, unpleasant hill. Always, yes. But you could redo the whole thing. In theory, Penn State could go from – it's at 110 now. It's too big. Penn State could go from 110 to 75, and they could redo the whole thing because it's it, – there's nothing around it. There's no school buildings. There's no, there's no parking lot. There's no, like, parking – garages or really anything so they could could redo the whole thing if they wanted to Mm -hmm. maybe they will um i assume eventually they will nebraska i think it's got room to do some of those things on the south and east sides i was surprised too and maybe you would agree but like i i thought there would be some more feedback as to what they would do with the students as well in the southeast section there and how they're pushed up way to the top and i think that also speaks to kind of the how do you want to treat the next generation of people that are going to be your major donors over the long term. Right. You understand like that's a tough conversation to have because if you move them down, you're displacing somebody to move them around. But it, it feels like if you were ever going to have that conversation, this would have been the time to do it. So I, you know, I, I still think, you know, you look around the country and you see student sections right there on one of the end zones and they're making a difference in the game and it yeah. encourages people to go. And so to put them up into the corner, the way that, that they have, I don't know, it, that, that felt to me like an opportunity to hear some feedback from fans. I, I get the sense that that's something that they would like to change too. North stadium. What do you think of that? They take up, they take up the first, however many rows of North stadium. How many? Well, a lot. Oh, like, oh, you, just, you, just go, you just oh, move yeah, all yeah. the way up. I see what you're saying. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yes, yep. that'd be great. And it doesn't, I mean, make it south. The south Stadium is going to be premium. North Stadium, like maybe you can move some people from north to south. And then all of a sudden you create a new. See, I think they have to move the students. If they make South Stadium premium and they put some ledge seating in and they put some new chair back stuff in and it looks cool, um, you're going to move the students north. And then you just create a big chunky North stadium section a little bit like Illinois, although Illinois isn't very big. um, But like that, you put all the students together and, you know, you, you make them a factor in one of the end zones. And then the other end zone is sort of the cabana, which is what I think, again, I think that's what you'll end up doing is making Mm -hmm. one of the end zones, a premium and the other end zone for the students. And um I don't know. There's some good seats over there in the end zone. The walls, the, I will say the walls at Memorial Stadium were high. And so like anybody who's ever been there, I don't how many feet is it from off the ground? It's like 20. Yeah, it's about right. Yeah. So like you're a little ways away because of the way they built the thing, but that would be what I would do. Put them in North mm-hmm. Stadium, give them the whole, the whole section and kind of let them go, you know, and then when a game is in overtime, your team can select that, that end zone to go into. Right. So like we said, one of the 
major components of, of what's keeping fans away is the team performance. I'm curious, Sam, as we shift this discussion to the team itself, now we had a chance on Monday to, to talk to a couple of players and coaches. Uh, we're, we're recording this on a Tuesday here, so quarterbacks are going to be up uh, later this week on Wednesday, and we're going to hear from them. I'm curious, as sort of as we head into that uh, chat with those guys, what do you make of that room right now? Because we're, we haven't really heard from, from much of anybody since the end of last season. We've got two new transfers in the mix and Casey Thompson, Chubba Purdy, an early enrollee and Richard Torres and two guys who were backups and, and sort of, uh, you know, understudies last year in Logan Smothers and Heinrich Harburg. Like what, what are you curious about with that group going in and, and how would you kind of just describe that dynamic with all these different perspectives and maybe talents uh, that are in that room? Well, we're going to kind of meet him a little bit more tomorrow. Um, I, you know, I, I'll say this. Um, I feel like the buzz around Casey Thompson has been as expected. I think people like him. I think he'll handle himself well. I think on Thursday we'll come away from it saying he handled himself well. Um, Wednesday, I should say. Um, you know, what, what matters there is he's got to not only gain the trust of the, of the quarterback or the, the, his teammates and coaches, but the fan base. And then, you know, part of who he is is going to be the decisions he makes on the field. Um, everybody thought Adrian handled himself really well, too. So um, I'll be curious to see what uh, Chubba Purdy says. I mean, basically the first question is, you know, what if you don't win the job? What are you going to do? Like, how are you, how are you going to function? Same with Logan Smothers. Smothers will be a little different, I think, because he'll be able to say, well, you know, this, I, I, this, this was my job at the end of last year. And uh, Purdy, Purdy can't necessarily – say that um i'll be intrigued to talk to frost and whipple and uh you know um i like to watch people you know i i i've graduated slightly from the beat writer role and just kind of i try to take one half step back and just kind of watch a little bit and so what i try to try to do is i kind of try to watch from 10 feet away sometimes and just get a sense of people's body language and the way they answer questions not necessarily what they say, but how they say it, um, you know, the responsiveness. Uh, I, so I watch people a lot. I think you can learn a lot from that more sometimes than you can from somebody telling you something. And so, you know, I think I've got a pretty good sense of where the kind of guy Whipple is and, and the confidence that he can create in a head coach um, because Whipple does just have a, a incredible memory and clearly, uh, notable knowledge and uh, I'll be curious to see how the quarterbacks handle themselves and you know what what uh, the head coach the quarter you know and, and Whipple say about it you know like um and you know they you got to be able to play a little bit of a politician there by you don't want guys to leave I mean you you'd love it if all three quarterbacks stay there's a lot of positions where you're like you, you can go but you know I, I think you would love to have three scholarship quarterbacks stick around nothing wrong with that He'll take it, uh, even four, you know, sure. Uh, I don't have to put in a walk-on as a backup. That's great. Works for me. So, you know, I think uh, I'll be watching that. Smothers a little bit. Um, Smothers, you know, I thought was a really nice guy last year. He's going to have to grow. He's going to have to grow a little bit. Um, I thought it showed in the fourth quarter of that game. Um, you know, Nebraska didn't seize that moment. He didn't seize that moment. And, he, and what lessons did he learn from that? Because while the block punt was the reason why the game shifted, there were things that Logan Smothers did and didn't do that really hurt him And in, in, that, in that final quarter. And you know what did he learn from that? Because if he had won that game, let's just be clear, if Logan Smothers had beaten Iowa, they'd won that game and you know won it, I don't know, 28-16 or whatever, I, I don't think the conversation we're having at this moment is the same. Because I think every single conversation would have started with, well, don't tr don't count out Logan Smothers. After all, he's the guy that he's the first guy to beat Iowa since 2014. That's a good but point. He but he didn't do it, and some of it was because of him. So, yeah. what's well, the lesson was he learned? Well, he he dropped the ball at the end of the third quarter. It was his fumble, and if he doesn't fumble that ball, he might have been running. Still, I mean, I don't know. And that was if that was his fumble. That was before the block punt. The block punt came right at the start of the fourth quarter. And so that was his fumble. And then he fumbled again. And then the interception, my understanding, had nothing to do with him. That was a mistake by the receiver. But, um, you know, 
there was a chance and, and they didn't get it done. And so there, you know, there's this, that, and the other. Yeah, that's true. I, I mean, you could argue that they wouldn't have been in position to beat Iowa if it hadn't been for what he did earlier, but it, it, it's, it's also true that, you know, what he did in that game in terms of running the ball was not sustainable over a full season. I mean, what did he, what did he carry it? 20, 20, 25 times, something like that. I mean, that's it's, right. It just, it's not going to, you're not going to hold up physically over the course of a season if you do that. But the room to me is fascinating because you sort of have, you have the handpicked guys in Thompson and Purdy, who the new offensive coordinator went out and got, you have the two guys who were battling for that backup job last year. I think I'll be just as interested to hear what Harburg and Smothers have to say about the offense this year as anything, because they'll, I think, be able to provide some insight into just, how similar or how different it might actually be from what it has been under frost. How much more are they supposed to stay in the pocket? Like that's what we heard yesterday from Eric Chenander and some of the defenders was Casey Thompson and these other guys uh, are staying in the pocket longer. Like they're, they're, they're hanging in, you know, longer to try to, to make the throws instead of bailing out and running the way that they did a lot last year. So I'll be fascinated to see too, um, you know, again, like how, how much, what they're being asked to do is any different, how that adjustment to Whipple is going, how much frost is involved, all that stuff will be fascinating to see as it plays out tomorrow. Yeah. There's no question that like, I don't know how to put it. Anchoring your rear end in, in the pocket is, is important as a college quarterback. It just is. It's a, it's an important facet of being good. Um, and you have to be able to, the thing that you get in being in the pocket is you 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 uh, you have all passing angles available to you. So when a play is designed, it is designed with a person relatively in the middle of the field in mind. Now, obviously, you're going to improvise and do all those other things, but um, you know, uh, really, really good teams try to keep their quarterbacks in the pocket because it keeps the play call, unless it's a bootleg, true. And, it, you know, learning how to manipulate that pocket or move in that space is one of the maybe one of the, the hardest things that, a, that, a, that a, uh, the college football player has to do is learn that. And so, you know, I think that'll be interesting to watch. Certainly Thompson's more of a pocket guy than than Martinez was. And, and I think Whipple's also going to coach him to get the ball out. I think, yak. we'll talk more about that. I'm going to talk more about that with Whipple tomorrow. You're going to hit the quarterbacks tomorrow. Chattel's going to hit the quarterbacks tomorrow. I want to talk about Yak. And I'll talk about the quarterbacks too. But I want to talk about Yak. Yards after catch. Mm -hmm. How do you create that schematically? And how do you find quarterbacks who can create it? So I think the thing in watching Mark Whipple's offense that has, that has been notable to me is he is able to scheme plays that are seven yard passes that turn into 40 yard passes and the 40 yards is good either way that both 40 yards count for 40 yards. And so there's crossers, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. And I think Whipple does a nice job of getting his guys open and then his quarterbacks put the ball in a spot where they can, they can get yak yards. And um, whereas I would say this about frost and I'm not being critical when you look at some of Nebraska's bigger pass plays last year, Evan, where did they occur? Downfield. Deep, deep, deep downfield, yeah. Play action pass, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I mean, elaborate play action pass, you know, fake, roll, set, throw to a tight end 32 yards downfield, like long developing plays that are hard to replicate over and over. And rarely did they just have, hey, we're going to step, we're going to throw quick, and it's going to turn into something. It's going to turn into a 45-yard play. A hitch goes for 45. That didn't happen that much. When they would throw short, it wasn't very pretty. The few times that they threw long, they hit bets against Oklahoma. But a lot of times, they weren't able to just throw a, you know, throw a ball up, you know, a go route to the sideline between the numbers in the sideline and hit it. Um, they struggled to hit hole shots. And a whole shot for people who don't know what that is, is between the corner and the safety, um, usually on the other side of the, the numbers or around the numbers of the field. 
It's a hard throw, but it's a necessary throw for good for good offenses. You you have to make that throw sometimes because it 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 forces that safety to think about it. And if he thinks about it one time too many, all of a sudden you're sneaking a tight end up the middle for 40 because that safety's cheap. So there's all kinds of little things that I think Nebraska's got to get better at when it comes to the intricacy of the pass game. And I think Whipple will probably get them there. Hmm. We have a Jimmy Watkins sighting. He is en route to Indianapolis. How's it going, Jimmy? On the road again, boys. How are you? Please, please, please be careful, Jimmy. I'm doing my best out here, Sam. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions, give Evan, Evan a kind of a break here. So, um, all right, let's start with this. We'll start with this. Bryce McGowan's was AP freshman of the year, but he didn't get Big Ten freshman of the year from the coaches of the media within it. This seemed to be kind of a uh, shocking development today. That said, when we were walking out of football practice on Monday, you predicted it. Why did it happen? It happened because it happened for two reasons. First of all, I think coaches especially weigh team success heavier into these awards than um, media members do. And Malachi Branham obviously had a whole lot more of that at Ohio State this year. They won 20 games or so. Nebraska won 10. And I think, I mean, the other thing is if you just look at their numbers, I know that if you look at the full scope, I think for the season, Branham was getting 13 a game. Bryce was getting 17-2 or something like that. Um, but during Big Ten play, they were essentially the same player. I think Bryce was grabbing one more rebound and <clears throat> maybe scoring a little bit more, but they were pretty much the same. And Branham was just scoring so much more efficiently. I think he was shooting about 50% from the field, 40% from three. Bryce is 41% for the year. Um, he, his three-point percentage was steadied for a while at around 35 in Big Ten play, but it fell off again. So I just think that people sort of – really, I mean, Chucky Hepburn would have been the third guy of the team success. Really any other freshman putting up big numbers. So I think when Bryce got off to the start, he did. People just kind of pencil him in. And the other thing is, you know, people look at these Big Ten Freshman of the Week awards and think that that should, you know, if you win the most Big Ten Freshman of the Week awards, you should automatically win the Freshman of the Year award. That's just not how it works. It's a, no, it's irrelevant. It's a, Those are not yeah. selected by the coaches or the media. They're selected by staff at the Big Ten office and stats, and they're very stats driven. Precisely. And I think people put a lot of stock into that game last week against Ohio State where Bryce scored 26 and – Nebraska beat the Buckeyes at home and Branham had, I think, you know, 15 points on 11 shots. It's just a bigger picture than that. People were, especially in Nebraska, I think Nebraska fans were just, you know, the one thing they had to hold on to every night when they were mostly upset watching Nebraska. And Jimmy is frozen. You knew it was coming at some point. Yeah, I did. And he's just frozen. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, the fact that they've won three games in a row. And if Jimmy comes back, then uh, maybe he can hang up and pull over and do it that way. Um, Evan, what have you seen of why they've won three games in a row? To be honest, I have not been in a place to watch a ton of those games, but okay. but but I will say, like, what's been surprising to me. Well, we is... have this awesome. Hey. Jimmy is back. Hey. Let's pull over. And then that way we won't have to deal with the roaming. I can't promise yet. Should I actually? Yes. Yeah. Okay. See, yeah, the way that works is that, like, you go through zones where there's not a cell phone tower. And so that's why. <laughs> Already, that, that that'll make it easier. It will be, we'll be able to, you know, see it. Hopefully, oh, I'll see his expertise here in a moment. But I would just say, like, watching it from afar, what oh. stood out to me has been the fact that they've had they've been right around, you know, the lead or right in the game at halftime and early in the second half. And typically, that's when the wheels come off or there's a long scoring drought. And somehow, and, and maybe you can speak to this, Jimmy, but it, it 
somehow they're able to, to continue to score or at least get some stops when they need to. And so these expected late fades where they, where they go off a cliff just haven't happened. That to me is the most encouraging part of this recent stretch is that particularly in that Wisconsin game when they had a whole bunch of um, referee happenings go against them and they fell behind by 10 points and you could just, this was the script for them the entire year. This is where they fall apart and they end up losing by 10, 15, 20 points. Them battling back from that is when I started to consider, okay, maybe there's a real change happening here. Maybe, maybe what there's some validity to what Hoiberg has been saying all year about they just need to see one and that can change habits. And I think it was probably an oversimplification at the beginning of the year, the explanation where we're not making shots and it's, and it's affecting us in other areas. But I, again, I do, I've, I've made this point before on the pod. I do think there's something to that when all of your players or most of your players, like their identity of a, as a basketball player is wrapped up in how I score or how I shoot. And they're not doing that very well. I, it's, it makes sense to me that that would hurt them in other areas. Like if Sam has a rough morning at home and he comes into work and then, you know, he's a little snappier with me in a meeting. That's not necessarily, you know, it, it's, it can carry over. That that stuff happens in, to everybody in all walks of life. So I think there's a little bit of that. They're, they It started with Penn State. They were making a bunch of shots and it kind of rolled from there. I'm just yeah. enjoying hearing the turn signal. Those are yeah, I was going to say, I'll mute my hazard lights. <laughs> Really I was working. really enjoying the metronome of it. The uh, do, 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 do. I thought he was turning, and then it was like, "Oh, he must be pulled like off the road." Okay, thank you for being safe, though, and that's legal to do. So that's that's good. Um, how Jimmy? Can they sustain this? They play north, so they know who their next three opponents are. This is rare. It happened a couple of years ago. Um, when Nebraska made a little run at the Big Ten tournament before Tim Miles was fired. So they know they're going to play Northwestern. They know if they win that game, they're going to play Iowa. And if they win that game, they're going to play Rutgers. They know those things in advance. Um, a, does that help? You don't, I mean, you know who to scout. There's no, there's no mystery. Uh, a, does that help them? And, and B, uh, can they win the first one? That's maybe the big question. Did we lose Jimmy? Oh, he's back. No, he's there. He's gone. I'm going to give my opinion here. Yeah. Um, I think Nebraska is going to have a hard time beating Northwestern because of the kind of team Northwestern is and the things that Northwestern uh, – Nebraska's had a hard time stopping Northwestern over the last three times they've played them. Fred Oberg's never beaten Northwestern at Nebraska. I think he's 0 for 5. Uh, it's a hard matchup for them. Northwestern can play five out. They can shoot the ball. Everybody can shoot it. Uh, Nebraska's three-point defense hasn't been um, stellar all, all season long. Um, I think they've they've definitely had some some moments where you kind of wonder what what's going on. Um, and then, but but if they were able to pull that off, Evan, uh, I would be really really dubious as to whether they could beat Iowa. To I've said this a couple times before. The only way they're going to beat Iowa is if Iowa misses shots because Iowa in many, many ways does many of the same things that Nebraska uh, wants to do. They just do it better. And when you play teams like that, it's really challenging because you're playing a team that, you know, doesn't have to change who it is to win a game. They don't have to, they don't really have to do anything other than exactly what the heck they want to do to play Nebraska. And honestly, I think Northwestern is in many ways the same way. And so those, those games I think are challenging because um, I I feel like it just comes down to, I don't know what you want to call it. So when I go and look at the games, uh, first of all, Nebraska's effective field goal percentage in the last four games is 58.9, 70, 57.3, 58.3. Guess what? That is the highest four numbers that they've had all season against a power conference opponent, a major opponent, so to speak. 
They've had some high numbers against mid-majors or low-majors like Kennesaw State and Idaho State, but that's not this. Then you go and look at the effective field goal percentage of the other two teams. Well, okay, so Penn State was at 54.3. Nebraska beat Penn State because Nebraska was on fire. But this is important. The other two were 44.7 and 44.2. 44.7 and 44.2 are A, pretty darn low. B, very similar to the first time Nebraska played Wisconsin when it was 44.1. And so I feel like Nebraska played a couple of teams in Ohio State and Wisconsin that missed a lot of shots. And when you miss shots against Nebraska, they've got a chance to beat you. You're going to get open shots against Nebraska, and Chucky Hepburn got several late in that game. But if you don't make them, they have a pretty good chance of beating you because they will find a way to slow down your posts or to stymie or frustrate your post players. So that's what it comes down to. If, if Nebraska is playing teams that hit their shots, and frankly, Northwestern and Iowa have done that against Nebraska beautifully, if they're hitting their shots, Nebraska is not going to win. Because they kind just of, don't have enough counter, you know? It kind of – it feels like it's almost the reverse of what we've talked about with the women's team, where, like, their their weakness tends to be against ball-dominant, high-volume scorers like Caitlin Clark. Is, like, the men, yeah. their their trouble is against the teams that have, you know, steady, steady performances where it's sort of layered into their system where a number of guys are going to shoot, the defense is generally solid. Whereas the opponents that they just played, like they have, you know, standout players or two. And if they're off their game, if the shots aren't falling, then they have a chance to, to stay in it. So I, I feel like that's sort of what the challenge is for Nebraska with Northwestern and, and certainly with Iowa, where they're just so steady across the board that like you can't rely on one guy to be off. Like you need four guys to be off to have a chance as opposed to some of the, the teams that they just played and beat. Jimmy, is Nebraska going to beat Northwestern or Iowa? I think they'll beat Northwestern. Um, I do think a lot of their problems against Northwestern were, by the way, I don't, I don't know if anyone, if this was picked up on your guys' end, but I got booted from the shoulder of the road by a cop. So there's an update for you. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to my nearest McDonald's to push right. off some high five. Um, yes, I think they could beat Northwestern. I think a lot of their defensive issues against Northwestern – um, were super correctable and in the, in the first matchup at the very least super effort based and that this is about as motivated as this team has been since day one so I think that that stuff should be able to and, and Northwestern you know even if you leave them wide open they've shot like 31 percent from three against the rest of the Big Ten they're actually not that great of a three-point shooting team so 26 three-pointers in two games is, seems kind of unsustainable and I just don't think that I don't think that Northwest, I honestly don't think Northwestern has more talent than Nebraska. So assuming that Nebraska plays something look resembling what they have looked like the last seven days, I think they can beat Northwestern. Iowa is a much trickier deal. Iowa is going to, Iowa wants to play fast, just like Nebraska, which is unusual in the big 10. So Nebraska will be playing right into their hands. Iowa has more talent than Nebraska. Iowa will have the best player on the court. And Hoiberg will tell you that, you know, they lost that game because Tony Perkins, you know, had an out-of-body experience, which is to some degree true. But Tony Perkins is having a nice little stretch right now. He closed the season, I think, scoring 14 and a half per game on uh, in the last five games or so. So there, there's not a ton of options for uh, Hoiberg to hide people or, or help extra guys off of against Iowa. That's going to be a tall order. They would need Iowa to do something uncharacteristic to beat Iowa, I think. Northwestern beat Maryland, Michigan State, Indiana, Minnesota, and Nebraska twice. They're not a very good team. No. No, there's but not a lot of world. They have been better than – yeah, that, well, I'll be honest. I mean, they've been clearly better than Nebraska in those two games, though. Oh, yeah. Like, those were not games – I mean, Nebraska, <laughs> they were much better. <clears throat> no, you're right. <clears throat> but the first – again, I think this, the reasons that they were so much better were effort-based, motivation-based, 
And I think Nebraska has, has plugged a lot of those holes right now. I think that as long, <clears throat> as long as they can continue this mojo, the thing that I worry about is this is still a team. While right now it looks like they're playing with a bunch of resiliency and they can take a punch and all that stuff. We saw how easily that can change early on in the season. So I would be interested to see in that Northwestern game, what happens if Nebraska, you know, can't hit a shot for three and a half minutes, which hasn't happened in a little while. What happens then? Are they still going to be, you know, everything's different now and we're all together playing for each other and the defensive effort, all that stuff's still going to be there. I'd like to see that. Is Nebraska to the point now where they're actually doing load management on Bryce McGowan's like he was, he set out to, to prepare for the tournament. Is this what this has come to? I, I don't know what the deal with deal with Bryce's wrist was on Sunday against Wisconsin. I've, I've heard the term flexion more in the last 48 hours than I have ever before in my life. Apparently he couldn't bend it a ton. I do know from talking to people around Nebraska and around Bryce that if that was an absolutely must win, like win and you're going to the dance game, pretty sure Bryce would have played. And I'm pretty sure Bryce is going to play tomorrow night. I don't know, but I don't know what the deal was on Sunday, but I think they were just being a little cautious. Was there, it's a must win situation <laughs> from here on out. Yeah. 10 straight to the natty, right? Um, J- Jimmy's going to be covering uh, Creighton's NCAA tournament uh, run starting next week. So the chances of us getting Jimmy early next week when he's maybe on his way to Dayton, maybe on his way to, I don't know, Milwaukee, wherever they're going to play, maybe slim. So I'm going to ask you this question now. Um, the season's going to end this weekend. Nebraska's not going to win the Big Ten tournament. No offense to them. They're not going to do that. No, they're not. Let's say they win a couple of games and then they bow out and everybody applauds and all the rest. What What's next? What are the three things Nebraska basketball – is going to do in the next two or three weeks? Like what are the changes or what do you think we'll see? And it doesn't have to be overly specific, but like what's on the to-do list for Fred Hoiberg the minute this season ends, where does he go? What does he do? What does he evaluate? Step one is uh, evaluate his assistance. I think that that's part of, I mean, basically everything else about, Trev Alberts' Fred Hoiberg plan mirrors Trev Alberts' Scott Frost plan. So I, I think that there will be some encouragement, let's say, for Fred to do the same thing, to reevaluate his assistance. I'm not saying we're going to wipe everybody out on like Scott did on one side of the ball, but I do think there's going to be, and again, en- encouragement for Fred to take a hard look at his assistance. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some changes there. Um, the second thing is you got to figure out which of these guys, which of these older guys are coming back or not. You have to have conversations with Derek Walker, who I think is a guy they should want back because he's proven himself to be an efficient scorer. And I don't know if you want him to be your 30, 35 minute per game. Well, no big man really plays that much 30 minute a game, big man. But I do think he's certainly a valuable piece for a the 2022-23 Nebraska team. So Derek Walker's a guy you got to talk to. Lat man, I don't know how they feel about him. I think you could probably you could probably do better with another scholarship or a transfer guy there. Lat man's a guy you have to figure out. Trey McGowan's is a key. Um, I think Trey thought that he was leaving to go pro after this season at the beginning of the year. He got hurt. I don't know if that's on the table anymore. I know Bryce, I think Bryce is leaving, but I don't know what, where that leaves Trey. Trey you have, so you have to figure out what, what's happening with those guys. And we talked about this a little bit last week. With this resurgence, and even if, you know, let's say they win a game or two at the tournament this week, you can't, I don't know that you can let that cloud your view of what this group was too much. I don't think that you can just automatically bring everyone back because, or, or, you know, or bring someone back that you weren't planning on bringing back just because, you caught some good vibes at the end of the season. You have to take a, take stock of the bigger picture there. Um, so that's the second part. And then the third thing is go transfer portal hunting. Who is the point guard next year? 
We do not know the answer to that question. Kobe Webster and Alonzo Verge are gone. Bryce McGowan is the closest thing they have to another primary ball handler. I think he will also be gone. Even if you bring Trey back, I don't think that's his idealized role. So you're going to need somebody to run the show here. And this time, you know that you need somebody. So in theory, you should be able to find somebody who's a little bit of a better fit than Alonzo Verge. Credit to Alonzo Verge. He's sort of figured it out these last two weeks or so. I think over his last eight games, he's shooting like 50% from the floor. It's a good story, but he wasn't the right fit. So find a point guard, and then you got to fill in the blanks that are left by the the rest of the guys who are leaving. You're probably going to need to find another primary score because, again, I think Bryce is going to leave. So those you have two massive holes in your in your lineup two starters two of your, two, your two highest scorers i think are are going to be gone so that's that's the third option you got to reevaluate your coaching staff you have to figure out what's happening with this group here and then you have to fill in the blanks cuz it's going to you know i fred is going to have i think trev will understand the situation because it's kind of another reset but you, you can't you can't keep piling up seasons like this, man. So it has to be – you have to go out there and grab some high-impact guys who can help change this thing around quickly. Hmm. Well, the, the, the declare for the draft process in the NFL tends to be a kid gets done with the season. Uh, he, you know, he, he pokes around for a couple of weeks. It's getting close to Christmas. I'm going to the NFL draft. Like, it usually happens in December. You know, early December, mid December, sometimes earlier than that if you're a doman. In the NBA, you can um, basically declare that you're going to, you know, test the waters while retaining your eligibility. And so the Bryce McGowan's is he or is he leaving or is he not leaving story doesn't really have an ending until June, does it? It, it doesn't. You can, you can, uh, I think you have until about 10 days before the draft to withdraw your name from the draft. Mm-hmm. So, yes, in theory, I think it could play out. But I think, I think Nebraska knows the deal. I don't think Bryce, even if Bryce takes a while to officially say, I'm staying in the draft, <clears throat> I, I think everyone kind of knows the deal there. He, as long as he's projected to be a first round pick, which I think in the most recent mock draft I saw uh, from the athletic, he was right on the border there. But, he's since been playing better. And I think he's going to, like I said, last week, shine in those workouts. I think he will be a first round pick. He'll be in there. So Nebraska should be operating as if they're not going to have Bryce McGowan's. If he's not a lottery pick, why would he leave? I mean, it's, there's a couple of reasons. It's his dream. It's, life-changing money, even at the back half, me and Evan were talking about this yesterday when we had, we were eating at Canes, the lottery picks, you can get up into the, especially if you go, you know, if we're talking top 10, top five, you can get up six, seven, eight, nine million dollars. Back half of the first round, you're still talking, I think $2 million was, I was looking up Jordan Poole's salary uh, the other day. He was like the 27th pick for the Warriors a couple of years back. So it's still life-changing money. And I think a lot of these guys um, who are looking at at the NBA this early, they're just not that into the school portion of being a student athlete because it doesn't have as much utility to them. I think Bryce saw Nebraska as a, as a vehicle to get him to the NBA and not much else. I'm not saying that he won't, you know, come back and get his degree one day, but that's not where his focus is right now. His future is centered on basketball and should be. I mean, that's what's, that's what he, that's how he's going to make his living. We'll talk about this another day. Um, we'll go through the back half of the last eight drafts, and you tell me how many good players there are. It's, no, it's a fair point. It's a fair point. It's not. And how many? And more to the point, how many of them are underclassmen? It's it's less of a. It's certainly less of a certainty for you to create a stable role at at that draft position. But and, there's, and that's there's a worthy selling point to be had there. But I think. It's a, I mean, it's a situation where you can, where you can bet on yourself. Maybe Bryce does need a couple years in the G League, but I think eventually, he, I do think he can find himself a role in the league. Hmm. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the facts, the data, and see how many good players there are at the bottom of 
the first rounds, how long they were in college and, you know, what they're doing. Like I'm looking at the 2019 draft right now and basketball reference does a great job of this. And the best player in the back half of the 2019 draft in terms of playing is uh, Jordan Poole. You know, Keldon Jordan Johnson. Poole, I, mean, I don't even – Keldon Johnson plays for the Spurs. I, he I does. don't even know that guy. So. <laughs> Keldon Johnson's not a bad player. Jordan Poole is kind of like – I think Jordan Poole is actually not a bad comp for Bryce, though. Bryce is a little bit taller, but – Similar skill sets, um, slim guys, guys who are offense first, Jordan Poole's case, offense only. I, I don't know if I'd go that far with Bryce, but Bryce is mostly offense. And Jordan Poole took a, a few years to, to find his footing. He was in, in and out of the G League for a while, but now he's thriving. I think that would be the path that Bryce was, would see for himself. In 2020, it's Sadiq Bey, uh, Tyrese Maxey. Well, and these are... And these are late, like close to the lottery still. I mean, we're yeah. talking the teens with these picks. Yeah. Yeah. Desmond Bain. He's at the bottom of the draft, bottom yeah. of the round. Right. You go back to 2017. Let's see. Kyle Kuzma. Jared Allen. Uh, Derek White. John Collins, who's at 19. I don't know. I, you know, like if. It, it depends on if, if you want to be, you know, an all timer or I don't know, an all star. Uh, none of the guys that I'm naming are uh, P- past Siakam. He was right. He was an yeah. all-star a couple of years. Karis yes. LeVert. That's 2016. I, don't know, I mean, you tell me, I just, when I read the names off and I rattle them off. Okay. Uh, let's see. Bobby Portis, Larry Nance. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think the facts in terms of like not being drafted in the top 15 picks would lead toward returning to college, whether it's at Nebraska or somewhere else. But well, here's the but here's the other thing. What if Nebraska is just as bad as they were this year, last year, and Bryce's stock goes down again? Or what if Bryce yeah, gets that's hurt? Right. That's fine. Like that. Yeah, that's fine. Yep. That's the flip side of that. That's the flip side. I don't, I don't know. Best player, he's not the best player in the NBA. The most exciting player in the NBA at this moment played three years in college. We're talking about Ja? Yeah. I think he played two, but your two? point stands. Okay. Yeah. yeah. At Murray State. So. At Murray State. And they won a lot of games. They did. But you know, I don't know. I think I think that there's like a like I don't know. I think Kevin Durant change the conversation about what you could do in one year in college. And there really haven't been that many guys like him since. So, anyway, what else are we talking about? Media rights. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's hit on that. So Nebraska, this still is a move that needs to be approved by the board of regions in, it will. in April, but so it's not official yet, but they're, they're entering into a deal in principle yeah. with JMI sports to outsource yeah. their media rights. 12 years, it's worth $215 million to Nebraska to do this. Sam laid out, why does this matter to fans? Why does this matter to Nebraska that they're making this move? Nebraska is going to make more money than they made in their in-house operation last year. Um, you know, Nebraska can now outsource the headaches of this process. Like, you know, when you bring in employees and you bring in infrastructure, it's just more people to manage. It's more people to do this with. It's more people to do whatever. Um, and now they can, it can be out of house. They don't have to oversee people that they wouldn't have otherwise overseen. Um, and it makes it a, it makes it a more acceptable and palatable situation for, for, you know, the university of Nebraska's athletic department. Um, they're going to make what appears to be really good money. Uh, that's a ton of money. $18 million is a lot of money to make. That is uh, that's more than, um, shoot. You know, some of these teams are making off their their media rights deals. Uh, so it's it's a terrific it's a terrific number. It's certainly more than they were making in terms of revenue, I think, in the in-house and certainly more than profit. Um, so those those things, I think from a fan perspective, it's more likely that you're going to see NIL interviews on their shows once they outsource it. 
uh, now as it stands because they have in-house media. They can't, they cannot host paid interviews, um, whether they come through ABM or the radio station themselves pays them. They can't do it because it would be an NCAA violation for an in-house media company to do that. Once you outsource it, you know, that relationship has been severed and you don't have, you, those kids can just go there and it's possible that they might go there. You know, I know they're going on some other places, but one of the advantages of, of being under the, uh, the umbrella, so to speak of the same station where Scott Frost goes on the radio and Amy Williams and, and Fred Hoiberg, uh, the advantage of doing that, John Cook, is that uh, you know everybody's going to probably remain on the same page. And we've seen some situations where same pages have not been there. And, and I'm sure the athletic department, if they have the opportunity to funnel the athletes to a station that's going to take care of it and not ask, so how many cuss words does your head coach say on the floor? Um. It would be more likely. Not that I think that's a bad question. It's sort of an interesting question, actually. But it's not necessarily a question that Nebraska feels like somebody needs to answer. If that makes sense. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you think of like Greg Sharp going, hey, you know, so what do you what do you think of uh, what do you think of that coach over there? You know, is he kind of mean? Like, like, I don't know. Like, does that make sense? So oh, yeah. I could just see the NIL thing shifting a little bit. Um, that could be one thing. And it's just, it's just a much better setup for Nebraska. The in-house operation required a lot of management as it would anytime you bring in a big operation like that. So, um, one of the many baffling decisions made by Bill Moose, Ireland is the most, probably the most, the second Ireland game. The first one I think was made in a moment of whimsy and Irish charm or whatever you want to call it. I'm Irish so I can make a bad accent. Um, whimsy I'm like let's go do this we're we're gonna we're gonna take the big 10 by storm let's go play illinois and ireland yay you know whatever um this the second one though that didn't make much sense to me like you're 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 having a hard go you're losing games why would you agree to do it the following year i feel like that was that was just something that nebraska had the opportunity to walk away from and they didn't and so now they're they're kind of stuck playing a huge game across the ocean. So like that's not going to be a fun trip. That's going to be a business trip. Those kids are going to enjoy the trip only a little bit because they're going to be on pins and needles to win that game against Northwestern. Because if they lose that game against Northwestern, bad news. So it won't be as much fun for them as as it will be for fans. Yeah, no, I agree. Like the, it's interesting moving forward, but I imagine it won't be all that different from what their relationship was like with Learfield IMG College and how they outsourced their 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 uh, advertising departments and, and their radio broadcasts. And and, and that's gone. There, and you talk to people over there; you, they will tell you their quality of their broadcasts have gone down since they've had to do all of it in house. But why is that? They just don't have the resources for it. Uh, they don't have, maybe it's the equipment, maybe it's the manpower to pay for it. It's just sort of a, what What do we need to get it done as opposed to, hey, here are some bells and whistles that we can provide that that add to it, whether that's cutting up audio or, or different things like that. But to, to me, the interesting part has just been, you know, observing and gleaning from what this last year has been like. I mean, they built a studio in East Stadium to host their flagship radio program. They, they let go of people that were associated with Learfield that have been yeah, involved in Nebraska for a long time. Like there were, there were a lot of things, a lot of painful transitions. I think if you're, if you're closely involved with that, that's right at, at the time. And so to go back out, it'll be fascinating to see, you know, obviously from a money perspective, it's going to benefit the university, but what do they, what did they learn from this year long experiment mistake or not? that maybe it'll be different moving forward from what it was. So I don't, I know the pandemic factored into that, a change in leadership and everything, but will it this sort of go back to what it was like under Learfield uh, in their partnership with them, or will there be other changes? I think that's something I'll be curious too. Yeah. There's some people who I thought are pretty darn good that did that lost their jobs in that process. And it's unfortunate because yeah. again, it, it doesn't appear to have made any, it, it, it I don't think it's going to make nearly as much money as they're going to make. And I don't believe it made as much money as what they were making. So it's always tough to see 
to see that happen. Um, so it goes. So it goes. Uh, Nebraska women will probably be hear their name on NCAA uh, tournament uh, selection Sunday. Uh, they'll probably be uh, anywhere from a six to a nine. Um, uh, I, I think today maybe they're. Uh, let me take a look here. Maybe they're six today. Um, I think that could change. I think that number could move. Uh, won't move up. Will almost certainly move. Could move down. Uh, depending on what happens this week. Um, let's see where they're at here. There's still a six in the Austin region. Uh, Ames looks good to me. Uh, I, you know, that would be a seven. Iowa State's pretty comfortably a two. If Nebraska's a seven, uh, they might play Colorado. They might play Missouri. Um, I could see him being a seven. I could see him going down to Austin. Um they try, they try, they don't always succeed, but they try to be somewhat friendly in terms of the, in terms of the, the locale. Um, it always seems to work out like that. So you never know, you know, it would be awfully juicy. What? If they go a seven seed in Ames and they play 10th seed in South Dakota, that'd be good. That'd be really good. Amy has not scheduled USD since she got to Nebraska. I don't think that's something she really wants to do. Certainly they would play Nebraska in a, you know, in a New York minute, mm -hmm. but I think, I think she, she accomplished a great deal there and, and would have had more 30 win seasons at USD had she stayed. Um, she decided to take this on obviously as her alma mater, but um, I think that would be a hard game for her to, to coach. So that'd be interesting. It'll it'll be I, I I don't think there'll be a six I think there'll be a seven or an eight. You want to stay away from the eight nine line, but sometimes there's nothing you can do to avoid it. Hmm. Uh, Nebraska baseball went three and one last weekend in Arlington against opponents that they they needed to beat. They probably they should have gone four and zero oh if it wasn't for a, a bullpen meltdown late in their one game against UTA. Mm -hmm. And then Mother Nature's having her say this week. Yeah. Um, their, their first midweek game in two years at Kansas State was pushed back to Wednesday. And then Long Beach State said, nope, not coming to Lincoln with mid-30 degree weather. And uh, so they didn't. They, they canceled. They pulled out. How did Nebraska feel about that? Uh, I don't know yet. I'm, I'll be interested to hear feedback from, from coaches especially. Uh, you know, it was a raw – it's been a, a weird deal for them because San Diego State double booked. And so that is why they had to go to Arlington last weekend in the first place. And now Long Beach – um, apparently doesn't know what the weather's like in the Midwest in early March. And, yeah. and they were surprised by that, apparently. So Eric Cole and Trevor Bauer came up here and threw in the 30s. They did okay. By God. They That's came right. up here. I mean, they weren't afraid. So and Nebraska's it, still it feels play like with. that was just kind of, a, I don't know. It, are they going to get that series back or no? I don't, I'll, I'll, I'm going to do some digging to find out. But, uh, you know, the fact that they announced – the day before Nebraska announced it would lead you to believe that it was very much on their end to pull out. And, you know, again, it leaves Nebraska scrambling to fill an opponent when they were supposed That's money, to money though. Home. They're going to have to pay Nebraska money. Right. I, I would think. Yeah. yeah. So it's the second weekend in a row, they get hosed on a home home series. And so that'll get pushed back to Monday, but uh, they finally get some home games. Monday will be their first one now against Omaha. And then they play a couple midweeks, Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and they're home basically the rest of the month. So this is the time. There's not a lot of opportunity to build up your RPI, but it's the time where you need to build some momentum and start stacking some wins. So that's where we stand with everything. Other than that, nothing going on. So It's been really full. It's just uh, – it's been really full. We talked to the quarterbacks tomorrow. I think that will be pretty uneventful, to be honest with you. Um, I think we'll come away impressed. Um, and we'll move on. I'm actually really excited for, for football over the next nine months, but it's just, uh, this is going to be a proof in the pudding kind of thing. There's no way to, there's no way to hype your way out of it. They'll either do what they got to do or they won't. And they're going to play a hell of a lot of close games and they're going to have to, you're going to have to find a way to win them. Because they're, they're going to play – how many games do you figure will be within 7.6, 7? Yeah. 
Yeah. Right? And, 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 and they're going to have to find a way to win those games. Bottom line. Oklahoma is going to be a one score game. Indiana is going to be a one score game. People don't want to hear that, but well, Rutgers might be a one score. Game. They're going to have a lot of one score games this season and we'll see. They're going to have to find a way to play. Excuse me for yawning way better way better in, 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 in situational football. Um, and then, you know, my concern, I think, and I wrote about it in the rewind, there's some concern about that defense. I, I don't know. I just don't know how many players they've got. We'll, we'll find out. We'll see a little bit in the spring. I think spring game, we'll learn a little bit about what they have and have, have not, because I don't think Whipple will take it easy. I think he'll, you can, you can you can go after a team without showing a lot. I think they're going to try to test them hardcore in that in that spring game. Hmm. Well, it'll be fun. They have the, the availability Wednesday, then it's spring break, so we won't hear from them again uh, for another couple of weeks after that. So, yes, yeah, sir. As we go, all right. Well, for for Jimmy on the road and for Sam, I'm Evan. Thank you guys for listening. Enjoy the snow. Enjoy the seventy degree weather. Whatever it might be, we'll talk to you later.